On October 6, 1988, a man named Ken Wood arrives at the Walker, Michigan Police Department with a bizarre tale. Ken Wood proceeded to tell me that his ex-wife had been involved in some homicides at a local nursing home. Ken's ex-wife, Kathy Wood, is a nurse's aide at the Alpine Manor Nursing Home. Ken tells police she confessed to helping murder five patients with a fellow nurse's aide during the winter of 1987. Authorities remain silent as he pours out the details of his life with Kathy. After a short courtship with 20-year-old Ken Wood, Kathy, age 17, became pregnant, and the two were married right away. She gave birth to a daughter in February of 1980. As a new mother, Ken is really struck by the fact that she can't seem to bond with the child. She's irritated by the child. Uh, she won't spend time with her. Kathy withdrew and refused to do anything around the house. And she just basically becomes a, like a shut-in in his own house. Ken hoped that a new job at the Alpine Manor Nursing Home would be a positive experience for her. There was a core group of nurses aides there uh, that seemed to socialize together, and many of them were gay. They spent a lot of their time hanging out at a gay club. And Kathy became quickly caught up in that whole social world. Kathy's whole life changed. I mean, she was having fun. They are having parties, going to gay bars. It's not long before she had an affair with one of her co-workers. She had found in a lesbian relationship, the ability to communicate in a way that she never had with her husband. She was on a equal par with her partner and found it much more rewarding than a heterosexual relationship. Ken was humiliated and troubled by Kathy's behavior. That's when he noticed her dark side. Over time, he begins to see some of the little mind games she plays with him. For example, as she gets girls to call the house pretending to be old girlfriends of Ken while listening in on the other line. This is the kind of, of mind games that Kathy Wood plays with everyone, no matter who she comes in contact with, in order to create chaos around people where she can reign queen in the middle of all the drama. In August of 1986, after seven years of marriage, Kathy demanded a divorce. Ken moved out and took their daughter with him. Kathy was unfazed. She didn't really want to be a mom. She wanted to be the center of attention. And it's hard to be the center of attention when you're home alone with just a child and a husband. One month later, Kathy met Gwen Graham, another nurse's aide. Gwen worked in the nursing home. I didn't pay her much attention. But one day, I was sitting in the break room, and Gwen walked in, and that's the first time I noticed her scars. So I, I started watching her a little bit. She made me feel pretty. She made me feel special. She would do things that I wanted to do. The two had a relationship that lasted nine months before Gwen abruptly moved back to her hometown, Tyler, Texas. That's when Kathy told Ken that while they were lovers, they murdered five patients. Walker detectives don't know what to think. With such bold allegations, police must consider that Ken is seeking revenge over a failed relationship. The next morning, police run a background check on both Ken and Kathy Wood and find no criminal records. Detectives contact police in Tyler, Texas, where Gwen Graham now lives. They learn she has an outstanding misdemeanor warrant for her arrest for writing bad checks three years earlier. But she has no record of violence. Ken Wood's outlandish tale leaves detectives with no choice other than to question Kathy Wood. You know, I was suspicious. He believed Kathy. I felt there could be a lot more to the case. And it was up to us to figure out whether or not she did it. Police obtain a search warrant for the Alpine Manor nursing home. They examine employee and patient records. 
We were most uh, interested in some of the patients that passed away while Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood were working together. Ken Wood gave, I believe, two to three victims' names, especially the first one, which was uh, Marguerite Chambers. On January 18th, 1987, Marguerite Chambers died after living at Alpine Manor for five years. The cause of death was listed as natural. She was 60. A month later, 95-year-old Myrtle Luce was found dead of an apparent heart attack. Gwen told me that she was going to do her. That's what. That's how we said it, do her, so that no one would ever hear over here. And if they did over here, I was supposed to say it was a joke. I wasn't supposed to say anything about it. Less than a week passed before the next death. On February 16th, a nurse's aide discovered May Mason dead at age 79. Cause of death for May Mason was uh, a cardiac arrest, and she was also suffering from Alzheimer's. The nurse on duty checked uh, two hours before and uh, found that she was OK. Two hours later, she was dead. According to the hospital records, over the next few weeks, two more patients Belle Burkhardt and Edith Cook died in their rooms. Most people who go into nursing homes leave nursing homes that way. And 99% of the time, there's never an autopsy or a medical examination. There was no increase whatsoever in the number of deaths that they had when Gwen Graham and Kathy Wood worked there. So there's nothing to show that these people were murdered. But a strange incident does spark the investigator's interest. One particular patient said he'd been attacked, but nobody took him seriously because in Alpine Manor, there were people with dementia, people that were hallucinating that would often say, someone's after me, someone's trying to kill me. Detectives compare the dates of the deaths to Kathy and Gwen's work schedules. We did find that uh, at the time of these deaths, that both of them were working. So it, it all kind of matched. It started to come together. Investigators interview Kathy and Gwen's co-workers to see if they ever witnessed anything suspicious. When Kathy and uh, Gwendolyn Graham first started at uh, Alpine Manor, everybody thought they were uh, OK people. Uh, but however, you know, after uh, a period of time, they, they got to be, in my opinion, a little leery of, of both of them because they chummed around together and uh, they played a lot of games. The nursing home actually becomes, in a sense, their own amusement park uh, for Kathy and Gwen. And these are games that, by all accounts, were instigated and led by Kathy. They switched patients from room to room, putting them in the wrong rooms to confuse other uh, staff members. According to co-workers, Gwen and Kathy's antics went far beyond seemingly harmless pranks. Kathy seemed to get a thrill out of stirring up trouble. Would, she would call the husbands and say, do you have any idea what your wife is doing? And then she would talk to the wife and say, do you have any idea what your husband is doing? Planning half-truths among people, keeping the place in turmoil, keeping the place in drama. She seemed to get a kick out of exerting control over people's lives. When asked if they thought Kathy and Gwen killed five patients, the nurse's aides are divided. Some of the co-workers thought that possibly these murders did uh, occur, and some didn't believe it. They didn't think that they were capable of doing that. I felt that it was necessary to grab Kathy. She was working that day and bring her down to the police department and talk to her. Kathy tells police it was a joke. She made up the story she told her husband. And I said, I don't believe it was a joke. And after interviewing for more than 40 minutes, she finally, well, 
He didn't make it up, but I wasn't involved. It was Gwen Graham. Michigan police question Kathy Wood after she confesses to helping murder five nursing home patients with her ex-lover, Gwen Graham. Kathy gives detectives the exact same story she told her husband, Ken Wood. Gwen would roll up a washcloth and place it over the nose and mouth of the potential victim and smother them to death. According to Kathy's uh, version of events, Gwen killed patients in order to, quote unquote, relieve her tension, that she would become very tense, but when she killed somebody, she would always feel better afterward. These are kind of a thrill killing. Thrill killings are much more an expression of a deviant personality. And if these women killed these people, it would be for excitement. It's comparatively rare for two women to be involved. Only about 5% of the violence uh, is committed by women. Gwendolyn Graham uh, suffers from two coexisting personality disorders. She suffers from borderline personality disorder, and she has a great many psychopathic features. What that means is that she is chronically unstable in terms of her moods and her interpersonal relationships. They vacillate without reason from good to bad, from love to hate, from happy to sad. She will commit acts against people, aggressive acts, antisocial acts against other individuals. Gwen spent most of her youth on a farm outside of Tyler, Texas. After the fifth grade, my parents moved to Texas, and we lived there. I lived there most of my adult, my teenage years. Gwen's father raised her with, lack of a better word, kind of a country psychology, that it was good for a child to see life and death, to see where food came from, you know, how animals were turned into food. And so Gwen, often had to witness the slaughter of pigs and the beheading of chickens. Her father had ordered her brother to kill Misty, her little dog who she loved very much, because he had barked at a horse, which resulted in the rider being thrown. Gwen went out, dug up the dog, and saved its teeth and its skull in a little alabaster heart box, which she carried with her. Her mother didn't show her much affection. Her father had the idea that, that if a baby was held by its mother, or a child was held by its mother, it became weak. So Gwen spent a good part of her very early development untouched by her mother. According to Gwen, her father became a violent substance abuser who sexually molested her. In the borderline personality disorder, sometimes they literally feel as though they're falling apart. Their personality is falling apart. They need something to ground them. And the way they often do it is by burning and cutting. Uh, Gwen had 31 different scars up both of her arms from hot cigarettes she'd put on her arms, as well as a series of small cuts. These are cigarette burns, and I have cuts, a few. They were done when I was 16. I was angry for being molested, and I did it in an effort to, to make myself ugly so it wouldn't happen again. At 22, Gwen moved to Grand Rapids, Michigan, and got a job as a nurse's aide at the Alpine Manor Nursing Home, where she met Kathy. Kathy Wood grew up with her own dysfunction. She was born near an Air Force base in Washington State in 1962. Her father served in Vietnam. Well, Catherine Wood's childhood, in some sense, is, is a bit of a mystery because we only have pretty much her accounts as to what her childhood was like. Uh, the way she portrays it is that she was unloved, that her mother was very harsh on her, that her father was physically abusive, 
uh, that she had very few friends. I didn't um, socialize for a while. I stayed by myself. I was a real shy kid. Even her introduction sexually to the world was a somewhat macabre introduction and that she had fell in love with a young boy, had her first sexual experience, and it turned out to be a female. She spun this into quite the story that this was her first homosexual uh, relationship and that she was very confused afterwards and felt very betrayed. As it turned out, Kathy knew exactly who she was. She never thought that she was a boy. So in a sense, this was a story that was made up by Kathy Woods to incur sympathy from other people. Kathy Woods was diagnosed as being both a pathological personality with narcissistic behavior. Narcissism is a self-centeredness where other people are only seen as extensions of your own needs. Uh, you see people as they're only good to you for what you can get from them and that you are better than everybody else. So it's a kind of a grandiosity where the rules don't apply to you. When they met, Kathy Wood and Gwen Graham formed a strange bond. There was a kind of synergy to the relationship. Kathy was much more of a sophisticated, manipulative person, where Gwen was much more of a directly aggressive, acting out kind of person. So what you found is similar personality types, but one more sophisticated than the other. According to Kathy, Gwen's aggression begins to show itself in late January of 1987. At this time, Gwen was getting more physical, more violent. She tells police that after Gwen killed Marguerite, she forced her to help kill more patients. Kathy served as the lookout on the room where the murders were being committed. Kathy says that she was terrified of her lover. Gwen would supposedly take these washcloths and put them in her back pocket and walk around the nursing home with them as a way of intimidating Kathy and uh, letting her know exactly who wore the homicidal pants in their little family. I went to Ken because I was afraid that something would happen to me. She told me that she had no part of it. And she was very believable, you know, but she was not taking any responsibility. I thought she was manipulative. Tom, on the other hand, was trying to fit these pieces together. And I just kept thinking that she's not telling the whole truth. She may have an ulterior motive here. To describe Kathy Wood socially is like trying to describe a chameleon. She could be whatever she needed to be to get whatever ends that she was trying to achieve. So she could be very sweet and passive and almost victim-like, but she could also be very terse and very brutal. When investigators express their doubts about Kathy's story, she tells them that she can prove it is true. She says she has a collection of letters from Gwen, as well as souvenirs taken from the rooms of the patients Gwen killed. That evening, we went over to her house and um, we obtained a box full of letters that she had correspond with Gwen Graham. She couldn't locate any souvenirs that she had told me that were taken from the victims. Detectives are further disappointed when they read the letters and find nothing to link the two to any crimes. You kind of scratch your head and, and say, well, where are we? You know, where are we in this investigation? It seemed like we're going round and round in circles. So far, detectives are unable to verify any of Kathy's tales of murder at Alpine Manor. She agrees to take a polygraph test. She failed. The polygraph operator felt that it was a total hoax, made-up story. However, Tom Freeman thought strongly that she was telling the truth. To be sure, detectives want to talk to Gwen Graham. I ended up flying down to Tyler, Texas, where I met the investigator down there. Based on Gwen Graham's bad check charge, detectives obtain a search warrant for her home. When they arrive, they are met by Gwen and her live-in girlfriend. She's only five foot two. She seemed mild, 
and polite. She didn't seem like the person that everybody was saying she was. Gwen agrees to come to the station for questioning while officers execute the search warrant. Police look through her home, but find nothing connecting Gwen to the deaths at Alpine Manor. At the Tyler Police Department, detectives interview Gwen. They are unprepared for what she tells them. Police from Walker, Michigan, investigating the deaths of five patients at a nursing home, travel to Tyler, Texas, to interview prime suspect Gwen Graham when her ex-lover accuses her of murder. Gwen denies any knowledge of murder. I was not present at the time of any of these people's deaths. I was somewhere in the building working, that's all I know. Kathy's a sick mind, she'd say anything. When they ask Gwen about her relationship with Kathy Wood, she says that everything was fine at first, but then it took a darker turn. For Halloween, Gwen dresses up as a patient of Alpine Manor, complete with the kind of restraint that they put on some patients. And later in a lovemaking session, these same restraints are used to tie Gwen down to the bed. And this initiated uh, this kind of sexual activity. Kathy's obsession with manipulating people started to come between them. I got tired of her playing games, all the games that were going on with people's heads. Gwen claims that Kathy was physically abusive and dominating. And so Gwen begins a secret affair with another nurse's aide at the nursing home. Gwen says when she finally left Kathy, she started fearing for her life. Kathy threatens Gwen's new girlfriend, saying, you know, I can put Gwen away for a long, long time in prison. Well, this concerns Gwen and causes Gwen to move back in briefly with Kathy Wood. And during that time, Kathy ties up Gwen and takes Gwen's gun and threatens Gwen. I was begging because I thought she was going to shoot me. And then she just looked at me real strange and she left, she left the house. Gwen tells detectives that she eventually escaped Kathy by moving back to Tyler, Texas. She continues to deny that any murders occurred. She used the excuse that Kathy Wood was upset because that she had broken up with her. I asked her if she was willing to go on a polygraph test. She said she was. The results of the polygraph are inconclusive. Police return to Walker, Michigan. With no evidence of a crime, most of the authorities in Walker are ready to stop the investigation. I had everyone that was above me and below me thought it was a total joke and that she is making it up and it wouldn't go anyplace, even as far as the prosecutor's office. I can understand where they have that doubt because, you know, at the beginning of the investigation, it was a far fetch. But Detective Freeman cannot drop the case. His gut tells him that something terrible happened at Alpine Manor. On October 17th, 1988, he confronts Kathy about her failed polygraph. And I said to Kathy, I know you're involved in this. And the reason why you're flunking this is because you're not admitting you actually took part in all the homicides. And she walked away. And personally, I felt that it was over with. And it was unbelievable. Three days later, I get a phone call. Now she wants to talk. This time, Kathy admits she and Gwen planned the killings together when they invented a new game called the murder game. In the world that Gwen and Kathy existed, they were perfectly matched because what the other one lacked, her partner fulfilled. And so when you put these two chemicals, these two things together, it created an explosion. And in any explosion, 
people die. The object of the game was to kill patients in a certain order, so their first initials spelled the word murder. The problem with spelling out the word murder as the homicides occurred was that there were several patients that were very active and struggled, and they couldn't actually kill them. And so the game itself, spelling out the word murder, never got finished. It got to a point where it was the easiest patient to kill. Gwen is easily influenced by others for several reasons. One, she doesn't have a stable self-identity, which again says this is right and this is wrong. So she's very, very malleable in that particular sense. Uh, the other thing is that she's subject to uh, thrills and impulse behavior. So when people suggest things, she doesn't have that barrier that says, wait a second, that's a wrong thing to do. It's unlikely that Gwen would come up with any kind of sophisticated plot, like spelling the name of murder by the victim's initials. That really is not her style. Kathy says that with every murder she and Gwen committed, they grew closer. They would alter a favorite phrase they had. They'd say, I love you forever. And then it became, I love you forever in a day. And then it became forever in two days. And supposedly each day represented a murder that occurred. So after five murders, it was, I love you for forever in five days. And that was symbolic of the murderous bond that they had together. But after a while, it became more than Kathy could handle. According to Kathy, she took part as a lookout in these killings because she was so in love with Gwen and wanted Gwen to love her and was willing to do that until it came to the point, supposedly, that it was Kathy's turn to kill somebody with Gwen serving as the lookout. And that was too much for her. That's when she supposedly stopped. Soon after, Gwen left her for another woman. Detective Freeman is relieved to have what he feels is the truth. I felt that it was a, a start where I might be able to close this out with the actual arrest. On November 23rd, 1988, he takes Kathy to the Michigan State Police, where she is given another polygraph. Her choice was to be completely truthful and at least vindicate herself in the eyes of the detective who had treated her fairly. Kathy confesses to her role in the murders. The results of the polygraph exam indicated that she was being truthful regarding her recollection of the events, regarding her and her girlfriend, Gwen, having killed several people at the nursing home where they had worked together. And that the story that she was giving police was factually true. As far as Paul Mateer, he came to my rescue, basically. I simply demonstrated that his gut feeling was accurate regarding what she had been telling him. I think we're dealing with highly disturbed people, and their motivations are not the same motivations that make most people tick. So it's, it's conceivable. When I look at this and say, did they kill someone or not, it's hard to know. <laughs> In October 1988, Walker, Michigan detectives suspect Kathy Wood and Gwen Graham killed five residents at a nursing home, but have no indication of foul play. Tom Freeman wanted to continue with the investigation, and he felt strongly that a crime occurred. And most of us thought that something happened, but we were up to the end of our rope as far as where to go from there. We needed some evidence. And after obtaining information on the five patients that passed away, we found out that three of them were cremated. 
There was two other ones that had not been cremated, and uh, we were contemplating uh, exhuming the bodies to, to see if we can find some physical evidence. Based on Kathy's testimony, we were able to obtain disinterment search warrants for the bodies of two of the victims. The medical examiner inspects both bodies, looking for any signs of murder. During the course of those autopsies, there was no evidence that proved that they were actually killed by Kathy or Gwen Graham. We all look at each other and say, now what's next? You know, because we only have one person's word and maybe some other off-the-wall comments from other uh, employees from Alpine Manor. It's you're almost like at a dead end. They excavated the graves, dug up the graves, and took a look at the bodies. And the forensic pathologist changes the death certificate from natural causes to murder with no physical evidence finding as murder outside relying on Kathy Wood's statement only. I think that a disservice to forensic pathology because it wasn't objective. There was no objective evidence whatsoever in this particular case. With the death certificates changed to homicide for Edith Cook and Marguerite Chambers' deaths, Detective Freeman takes his case to the prosecutor's office. We were able to obtain warrants for both Kathy and Gwen Gran for the victims that we thought they were involved in. On December 4th, 1988, Gwen Graham is arrested in Texas for the murder charge of Edith Cook. Kathy Wood is arrested on one count of conspiracy to commit murder for Marguerite Chambers and one count of murder for Edith Cook. When reports hit the local media, the residents of Walker, Michigan, are stunned by the news. I think not necessarily just our town, but the whole Grand Rapids area, the community, you know, shocked. How often you have multiple murders in one location, and it's right in their back door. The trial is set for September 11th, 1989. In the weeks leading to the trial, conflicting stories only cause more confusion as to who is telling the truth. Kathy is, by definition, a pathological liar. When telling the truth may be more adaptive, she will continue to lie. And she uses it to her own ends. The narcissism kicks in where she needs attention. So she lies manipulates the environment, gains the attention she needs. It doesn't mean that she's not capable of telling the truth. It simply means that she's a bad person in a social context. You know, sometimes I'd like to say I made it up. That would be so easy. And then everybody could just be happy again, I guess. But that's not so. One of the hallmarks of the psychopath, and this is certainly true of Kathy Wood, is the ability to manipulate people. And typically the way that's done is they find people who are damaged in some kind of way. They haven't had their emotional needs met. They have some kind of opening that they work with uh, to meet their needs. And through meeting their needs, that's how they're able to manipulate them. And that's certainly the case with Kathy Wood, particularly if you look at her pairing with Gwen Graham. I would say that Gwen's tendency to seek out other abnormal characters certainly existed for several reasons. First, that's the only kind of person that would be involved with her. Nobody who's healthy would take someone being angry with you one minute, loving you the next minute, being inconsistent, stealing from you, and then expecting love from you. Plus, there are many unconscious elements that go into this. and. Uh, people who are um, uh, like Gwen will often seek out other psychopathic individuals and compliment them. While sorting through the case, authorities come face to face with her host of mental problems. Gwen Graham has two distinct sides of her. Uh, physically, she's actually a pretty cute girl. She's not very tall, has almost a cherubic uh, kind of face. Kind of bashful, shy, emotional, very sweet. But there's another side to Gwen Graham, 
which comes out particularly when she drinks, which is more like the fighting butch, the girl that likes to get in fist fights, has a bit of a temper, uh, won't back down from anyone, becomes combative. And when borderline personalities act out, they often do it without remorse. They lack what they call in Freudian psychology a superego or a sense of conscience in some way. So their reality testing is good, unlike a psychotic who thinks uh, people are out to get them. These people understand what is real and what is not, but they lack the normal feeling for other individuals. <laughs> Gwen is totally driven by her impulses because she lacks the part of the mind, which is the inhibitory part. The part says, don't do this, you're headed for trouble. In April, Kathy signs a plea agreement. In exchange for her testimony against Gwen, she is formally charged with one count of conspiracy to commit murder and one count of second degree murder. Based on Kathy's testimony at Gwen Graham's pretrial, Gwen is charged with one count of conspiracy to commit murder and five counts of first degree murder. Gwen maintains her innocence and insists that no crime occurred. The trial happened because Gwen Graham left Kathy Wood and moved away. Kathy Wood vowed to get revenge and to get Gwen Graham. She went to great lengths to do so and did so. She used this as her own revenge factor. Gwen had no history of killing anybody, and her assaults were like bar fights that she got into. So um, it's hard to know if she had done that. Could she be pushed to murder? Possibly. On September 11th, 1989, in Walker, Michigan, Gwen Graham faces trial for the murder of five patients at the Alpine Manor nursing home. Gwen declares her innocence as her former lover, Kathy Wood, confesses to being her accomplice. Since there is very little physical evidence, Authorities build their case on the testimony of their key witness, Kathy Wood. They focus on Gwen Graham's history of low-functioning borderline personality disorder. It's feasible for Gwen to be the murderer because she does have a great many aggressive and acting out tendencies. And again, uh, Gwen is very low-functioning, so she would be more likely to be manipulated to do it. But experts cannot say for sure that she did the planning. Given that Kathy appeared to be higher functioning, brighter, uh, much more of a planner, it would be more likely coming from that kind of personality than someone like Gwen. They consider that Kathy may have fabricated the story of murder for revenge. One would think that it would be uncommon because to turn the other member in, you're hurting yourself as well. Uh, but again, we're dealing with highly deviant people, and I don't think it's inconceivable for one to say, yeah, I'll go to jail for 20 years just to get her because what she's done. The reason that she put herself at risk to go to prison was she figured if Gwen was convicted in prison and ended up in prison, and Kathy herself was in prison, that Gwen would come to her and need her in prison, and she would control her and have her as a lover in prison as well. During the trial, Kathy's mental state is not brought into question. I tried to raise the issue regarding Kathy Wood's mental health status, and I was blocked from the court from doing so. Yet the court allowed the prosecution to yeah, bolster her credibility about her poor, you know, childhood and things that happened to her in her childhood, to, you know, so the jury got sympathy with Kathy Wood. But investigators are concerned. It was, it was tough because uh, we didn't feel like we had everything together. It would be nice to have physical evidence or a confession. 
and we had neither, so it was tough. There's no physical evidence. There's the only evidence they had was Kathy Wood's testimony, which was ludicrous at best. On September 13th, 1989, the prosecution's star witness takes the stand. She tried to cry. She played, oh, pity me type attitude. I have a fallen angel, and I want to do what's right, which was nothing but a mind game that she played. And she manipulated you know, the jury. She manipulated the prosecution. She manipulated the police. Every day, every day I wake up, and I know I've caused people a lot of pain because I was selfish. And I'll have to live with it for the rest of my life. I would doubt that to this day, she feels any genuine remorse for the fact that those human beings died. That's not a part of her psyche. Those people dying were just a byproduct of the interaction between her and her girlfriend. I saw the manipulation. The only people that weren't seeing it was the people being manipulated. Then, a surprise witness blows the case wide open. It's probably one of the weakest cases I ever had. I felt, at that time, I thought the case was very weak until we were able to obtain an interview with Glenn Graham's girlfriend. Regarding the witness from Texas, apparently they went through retrograde analysis, which is a fancy version or fancy talk for hypnosis. Her girlfriend relates a story that Gwen told her while they were living together in Texas. It corroborates what Kathy Wood has been telling investigators the whole time. It was identical, it's the same as Kathy had told me. And that was exactly 1,200 miles away and there was not a difference in each story. And it was very evident that there was never a contact between either party. And she relayed the same testimony as Kathy would. It was remarkable, not knowing each other. And it was very obvious Gwen Graham told her the truth, what actually happened. If somebody testifies after a hypnosis, it's not admissible in court. So the prosecution went far and above beyond their ethical obligation. On September 20th, 1989, Gwen Graham is found guilty of five counts of first degree murder and one for conspiracy to commit murder. She receives six life sentences. Gwen Graham was totally decimated by the verdict in this particular case. She knew she wasn't guilty of anything. She knew she was being railroaded. And we fought tooth and nail throughout the trial. And when they came back guilty verdict, it just destroyed her. When asked of the jurors at a poll, what's your favorite book? 49% said the Bible. The thought of six life sentences is more than Gwen can handle. She and her attorney are shocked and outraged that the conviction was decided with no physical evidence of a crime. Innocent, I'm, I can no more prove that I'm innocent than they ever proved that I was, that I was guilty. Kathy Wood pleads guilty to second-degree murder and conspiracy. She receives 20 to 40 years and is eligible for parole. She was quite willing to throw herself onto the stakes of criminal justice in order to reach the diabolical ends that she always had intended. Gwen Graham was railroaded in this case. She was you know, put on trial for her lifestyle and convicted for her lifestyle, which is a shame. My client is serving the rest of her life in prison for something she didn't do. I think that Gwen Graham is a sad character in all this. She's not the vicious, violent, 
soulless, heartless psychopath that Kathy Wood made her out to be. Gwen is her willing, maybe unwilling accomplice, entirely manipulated by her. I guess the most important thing to me is knowing that they're incarcerated and they can't do this again. I think that's a key thing. It's too late for Margaret Chambers and the rest of the victims, but certainly it's not too late for any other ones. It seemed like justice was served, but there's just a, a gnawing feeling that uh, maybe it didn't play out exactly. Maybe Kathy Wood had more of a, a role in the killing. I think it did happen, but uh, to be 100%, uh, I'm not. Kathy Wood is imprisoned in the Tallahassee Federal Correctional Institute. In 2005, she was denied parole. Gwen Graham is serving her time at the Robert Scott Correctional Institute in Michigan. This is one of the biggest miscarriages of justice I've ever seen in 35 years of crime reporting. As long as she doesn't tell the truth, as long as she holds on, to the truth, I sit here, and she had control over my whole life. It's all about control. It's all about vengeance. It's all about making good on her threats. If you ever leave me, I'll put you away for the rest of your life. Well, Gwen left her, and Gwen has been put away for the rest of her life. She did exactly what she promised she was going to do.